fourth generation Mercedes-Benz C-Class is here. We pit it against its two big German rivals. Up close and personal with Le Mans driver Neil Jani. Clearly, it's uh, Le Mans is obviously the race in our championship, being the 24 hours race. And we're riding the V-twin monster from Indian, the Scout. It's the all-new generation of the Mercedes-Benz C-Class, a nice little surprise from Mercedes-Benz as I mentioned on Twitter a few days ago. The car was expected only at the start of 2015, so it's good to see it right now, right here. But this isn't the only car I have here with me, there are two more. That's right, we've got the German rivals right here with us, the Audi A4 and the BMW 3 Series. These cars do battle all over the world. Now, of course, uh, you have certain other rivals which we currently don't have in our market. Cars like the Lexus IS or the new Jaguar XC. So it's really down to these two and for the Mercedes C-Class to prove that it's better than them. The last C-Class came out in 2007. Yes, seven years ago. So if this car seemed like a breath of fresh air when I first saw it, I was justified. It was in May that we brought you our comprehensive review of the new fourth generation car. At the time, I was impressed with the leap Mercedes-Benz has managed to take. The new C is lighter, litter and more agile. It's modern, beautiful and yes, it is indeed the baby S-Class as it's been popularly called all year long. So now that its launch in India has been pulled ahead, here's the car in the flesh on Indian soil. The new C will be launched only in its petrol avatar for starters, that's the C200 and it's a well-loaded package. But the numbers first and because this isn't an engine that I drove in May, I was keen to check it out and the numbers look ample enough, eh? especially that generous torque that kicks in as low as 1200 rpm there will be a diesel model a likely 168 bhp 2.1 liter c220 cdi that will follow that's when mercedes-benz begins local assembly of both the petrol and diesel c-class in the first quarter of next year so for now it's the fully loaded c200 that will be imported for starters but Mercedes-Benz assures me that pricing will take into account future locally made C200s. So let's wait and see on that when the car launches on the 25th. Now the first thing you notice is that the new C-Class looks new. To me, the solid and typical looks of the A4 actually work. I also think Audi defined pretty in this segment long ago. And the A4 still carries that torch but it looks admittedly sober with the 3 Series screaming sporty and the C-Class running away with the pageant crown for its sharp character lines, sloping roof line, the tailgate that drops off and the bold face with the organic looking lights. The baby S tag means that the interiors have to be super swanky and you won't be disappointed bit of an opulent feel you get in the rear seat of the C-Class. It's the materials, it's all very high-end, the color palette really works. Look at the wood, you've got the fancy Burmester sound system and even the seat, it's nice and plump, really comfortable. It is roomy as well, it doesn't have a sense of being cramped like the last C-Class and that's despite the fact that there's a sloping roof line, good headroom, the panoramic roof only adds to that sense of airiness. Even legroom, it's really generous and decent. And uh, well, you've also got a little bit of sense of control with uh, temperature as well as fan speed setting for the rear AC vents. And so overall, I have to say that uh, it pampers you just a little bit, this back seat does. And people in India 
like that kind of thing, don't they? Yeah, I have to say this touchpad is pretty cool and it makes the music system come to life. But that's not what I was getting at over here. The whole point is that uh, you've got a whole lot, a, a much cooler interface than what you had earlier with the command system getting severely updated. And uh, again, it adds that high-end appeal that this car exudes anyway. So good materials, very classy, nice little analog watch. The touchpad, which works pretty well, and an array of buttons over here. Everything is within reach and it looks really well finished. You also have all the carryovers from the S-Class. Remember, this is the baby S, which is why you're seeing all these elements. And uh, that also includes ambient lighting. Can't show it to you in this kind of bright light, but you've got three different modes. There's white, amber, and blue. So you can switch that on as well and feel a little kicked about it once the sun goes down. Hmm, so the cabin is a winner. But we're not sure whether that fancy Burmester sound system or panoramic sunroof or high-grade leather will make it to the Made in India scene. Now the 3 Series. This particular one has a rather yummy coral red leather trim. Now given that this is the driver's car of the pack, it's no surprise that it's also got the best driving position. You can really adjust the steering, it feels just right. The same goes for the seat. And in this particular case, BMW has thrown in the M Performance package on this car, which means you get a nice sporty seat which makes things even better. The 3 Series cabin feels a touch tighter on space and the equipment looks a little dated by comparison to the C, but it's high on quality. The car I have here has been kitted out in the M Performance trim. But speaking of dated, the Audi is certainly the dullest on the inside. Yet, it has some positives. It's certainly the most staid and boring cabin of the three, but I have to say that even though BMW started things off with the iDrive, it's the multimedia interface or the MMI on the Audi cars that still remains the most intuitive and uh, has probably the best interface. It's easiest to use. Though the new C-Class, the new command system, certainly looks a lot cooler. I can only wait to see what happens with the next generation of the MMI on uh, the next A4. And like the C-Class, this one also has navigation. Now time to get going. We're not testing like engines here, but rather comparing overall drive dynamics and the proposition. But rather comparing drive dynamics and overall proposition. Now in this particular segment, when it comes to sporty appeal and really precise direct driving, the 3 Series has always been the one to beat. I remember while reviewing the C-Class a uh, few months ago saying exactly the same thing that it doesn't seem to quite measure up to that. So I want to be able to refresh that experience and so uh, it's time to quickly measure that next with the C-Class. Yep, so I'm still carrying exactly the same impression. The car impresses when you compare it to the A4 but it still lacks that exact sort of very precise sporty feel that uh, you get so used to with the 3 Series. And so on that particular front, I think BMW has still got the benchmark. That's a pretty cool interface that you get on the A4 and it's got a nice comfortable driving feel. The steering as well has a good precise feel and it's uh, the right size too. So comfortable, yes, but as a result, it also ends up becoming predictable. And so which makes it a little bit boring when you compare to the other two cars. So the C seems to have it covered for the most part. The C-Class is also lighter than its predecessor by 100 kgs thanks to a 39% increase in the use of aluminium in the car's structure. And that does make the car a lot stiffer. Yes, the 3 Series remains the out-and-out -out driver's car. But the C is very satisfying to drive now, especially if you flick the agility setting to sport or better yet, Sport Plus. But in terms of ride quality, especially for buyers who are going to be sitting at the back, you'll find that the C-Class is a lot more comfortable. It doesn't have that stiff, hard feel. And from that perspective, for Indian roads, yeah, it surely is quite a winning package. The seven-speed gearbox is also smooth, but there are slight delays on downshifts in Sport Plus mode. 
The new C-Class is taking overall benchmarks for this space higher and now helps the cause of cars like the Audi A3 and even its own sibling the CLA by creating a good distinction between those new compact sedans and this segment. The Jaguar XE will try hard to be more posh while the next generation Audi A4 is going to also try hard to offer greater dynamics. So get ready for even more action ahead. Prices for the new C are expected to hover in the 32 to 38 lakh rupees price range. Now I have to say it doesn't get to be a clear absolute winner just yet because well we're still waiting on prices that's one and the second is that uh, the whole strategy from Mercedes-Benz isn't quite clear yet either. When exactly will that production rollout happen from the plant in Pune and when do we get the C220 CDI? Well all of these questions will have to get answered but the car will probably get a nice clean run because uh, cars like the Jaguar XC and the next generation of the A4, well, they don't arrive till probably the end of next year. On that note, it's time to slip into a very short break here on CNB. We have so much more. Stay tuned. Welcome back to CNB. Now we love him for his Indian connect, but it's his motorsporting talent that really impresses us so much more. Neil Jani, quite a prolific race car driver. He's driven in various formats, but off late it's Le Mans and the Porsche team for which he's been making news. Now he's been here in India and Bala had the chance to catch up with him. Neil, thank you so much for talking to NDTV. Uh, if I can begin by asking you in terms of, are you excited by the kind of growth you're seeing in motorsport in India, not just in terms of the interest levels, but also the kind of young drivers that are coming onto the circuit? Ah, oh, definitely. Uh, I think uh, talent or the youth is the future of the sport. And uh, the more they're coming, the better it is. And I think you have a great circuit with the boot circuit. You have the infrastructure there now, which is very helpful for, for a lot of uh, young drivers. Do you possibly see an Indian driver in the Formula 1 circuit given the kind of talent there is? I think it's, it's hard for everyone in the end. It doesn't matter from what country they come nowadays because it, it's, it's a pyramid and you know it gets uh, quite sharp at the end and it's just a lot of people falling out. Um, I think in terms of Indian drivers moving forward there, there are quite a lot which have some good rides around. I mean the, you got the two most famous ones with Narain and Karun who, who are doing well. Um, you got the younger ones like Aditya Patel uh, doing well in GT and, and there are more coming. So I think from that point of view, you, you got a good, good base there. Let's talk a bit about your experience in the endurance racing, the latest one that you're in right now. Uh, is it tough and what's been the biggest highlight? Has it been Le Mans? Very much happy with my uh, progress because I've started at the private team, Rebellion Racing, and obviously then I moved up and the target is always to get into a factory team to be able to win races. Yeah. And uh, I think now with Porsche I'm capable of doing so. And uh, you know in endurance racing, if you look at qualifying, it's clearly it's more prestigious. It's not so important on a six or 24 hours race where you exactly qualify as long as you're up there sure. at the sharp end. But if you're first or second, it's not so important. But it's about prestige. So you still go for it like in Formula One, like in single seater series, you want to have that pole. Formula One still on your mind? Um, no, clearly I'm, I'm signed up with Porsche. Um, I also have a contract for 215 okay. and I feel very comfortable there. Uh, it's one of the big brands, you know, it's one of the brands you connect with quick cars, yeah. motorsport success. 
So obviously I will try to, to hang on to that deal. And the plan is obviously 2015 win the world championship and win this famous Le Mans. Uh, that's, that's the aim and that's what we really go for. Niche cult bike brand Indian has been making waves in its home market, the United States, especially because of a brand new motorcycle that's uh, ridden out fairly recently. That's the Scout and it's now been launched here in India as well. It's a massive monster and Ashish spent some time with it. The first bikes to come out from the Indian motorcycle company after the Polaris takeover in 2011 were from the Chief family. They were all basically the same bikes, same platform, same engine and stuff, differentiated by cosmetic add-ons and whatnot. But the new Indian Scout does not share the platform or the engine with Chief motorcycles and many say this bike was a very logical next chapter for Indian. The Scout was Indian's racing product and took to many track and hill climb events. So in a way, it is a crucial product from a brand positioning standpoint as well. Scout has a lot of legacy behind it. The 101 Scout is hailed as possibly the best bike Indian ever made. And when Indian motorcycle was being resurrected by Polaris, I thought it would be with a bike that you see behind me, that is a Scout. But of course, I completely understand the brand play. They wanted to introduce the big and the badass motorcycles, uh, the three motorcycles based on the chief nameplate. Uh, but the Scout, I think, is a very good next logical step for Indian. While the three chief motorcycles are the big and burly kind aimed to attract slightly mature chaps, the Scout is that sportier alternative which is aimed at wooing the young and eager guys. The Scout here looks absolutely stellar, combining its retro cool halo looks and a fairly modern design. It has that future cult emotion about it and that's a cool thing. The very first Indian Scouts had a sense of edginess to the overall design and I'm really glad that Indian uh, has retained that even with the modern one. Uh, well, you see that in the shape of the fuel tank and the overall design. Uh, if you Google about the Indian Scout, you'll see that towards the mid-1930s, this model started to gain a little bit of shape and uh, had become a little fatter, gained a little bit of weight. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that uh, Indian has stuck to the original design. Uh, another thing that I want to point out towards is the engine. Now it may look like it's a push rod but it, it is not. It is uh, a proper overhead cam design, breathes via four, uh, four valves per cylinder but uh, the thoughtfulness that has been uh, invested into the overall design can be seen uh, in the engine as well. It looks like it's a push rod but it is not. The Scout's got the 1133cc engine and this is the important bit, liquid-cooled V-twin engine. The power rating is 98.6 bhp and it generates almost 98 nm of rotational force, torque that is. The six-speed gearbox too, though quite precise, doesn't quite come across as being very polished and that is a pity because overall the Scout is very refined. While for the most part the riding experience, whatever little of it we got, was very good, we do feel that the brakes could do with slightly more bite and the clutch could be made lighter. The suspension is very, very well sorted. It gives you all the confidence to ride over any sort of tarmac that you may experience. It, it negates the bumps in a very confident way. It doesn't waver it from its line and even the high speed stability is extremely good.
The Scout in this modern form still manages to capture that old world magic. With a sticker price of around 12 lakh rupees, you do get an uber cool motorcycle that's a fun ride. The younger guys who buy into the brand will certainly bring with them a longer riding future for the Indian. The all new C-Class and everything else we've showed you on the program today. Please react, please comment and remember the last few days we've been really talking about road safety. Do your bit, please follow the rules and regulations, please wear your helmet if you're on a two-wheeler and your seatbelt, whether you're on the front or the back of a car. Goodbye.